Hey, business building warrior, welcome to Silent Sales Machine Radio. Thanks for joining me for our weekend edition. If you're new around here, our weekend edition is simply when we go back in time to a successful student interview, one of our proven Amazon course students who's building a beautiful business, and we break down some of the best lessons and best moments from that interview. Because if you're like me, Saturday is the sixth day of the week, meaning, hey, it's another work day. Some of us work six, rest one. That's what God did when he created everything. So a lot of us follow that same model. I know I do. And Saturdays are quite often a day where you can grow your business, continue working on your business. And if that's you, we want you to take along our weekend updates. Well, today's episode is going to be one, like I said, where we interview a recently successful student. Maybe it's an episode that you missed and that sort of thing we'll get to in just a moment. Thanks for the feedback, by the way, if you've been listening to our weekend updates, we really appreciate that. But we've got some big news. Here we are kicking off summer of 2023 as I'm recording this, and we've just launched a great new product that I want to tell you about. You can go to Proven Bot Sourcing and see all about it, as well as you can listen to the recent podcast episode where we really dove in and discussed this. It was podcast episode number 647, located not too far back in time before this episode that you're listening to now. Provenbotsourcing.com is a new strategy for scraping virtually any retail website and finding potentially incredible replan inventory to help you in your Amazon business. We've really broken it down. It's brand new content, stuff that's never been taught anywhere before. Yeah, there's some tools you might recognize in the mix, but there's a lot of new elements. I don't care how deep you've dug into replans, you have not seen the details that we've uncovered before. It took us months to test this. So go check it out at provenbotsourcing.com. That's the only announcement I'm going to drop on you for now, except one last little tiny mention. Our conference is coming up July 6th through Eighth, plan on being there. Theprovenconference.com has all details. VIP tickets are almost sold out. We're expecting about 600 plus people to descend on Columbus, Ohio, July 6th through 8th. That's listeners to this podcast. We'd love to have you there. We've got over 40 breakout sessions with the great coaches and success stories from our podcast. You're going to absolutely love it. If you can't be there in person, check out the live stream option. Very inexpensive. It gets you all of the event recordings as well as live interaction during the event with everyone who's there. Very inexpensive. Go check it out. Theprovenconference.com. We'd love to see you join us. Hey, let's enjoy today's weekend update. Here we go. The beauty of the business model that we teach, the Amazon replens model, where we start 99% of all new e-commerce and Amazon sellers, is the low, low, high. You've heard me say it before, but bear with me. I'm covering some grounds that's been covered in other places before as I go through this, but this is going to be very useful, especially for those of you who've been around less than six months or so. Maybe you've heard us talk about this, the low, low, high concept versus the high, high, low. This was a concept that was first introduced to our community by one of the great coaching leaders on our team. Remember, I said we have 60 coaches. Well, they're divided up into groups. One of our coaching leaders named Robin Olson She was telling us about an example that she uses for her students when she's helping them understand the power of the Amazon replens business. And it's this. Most every business opportunity you can get into in the world, online, offline, anything else, almost all of them follow the same pattern. They follow a high, high, low pattern. Replens follows a low, low, high. That simply means All the other business opportunities are high risk, high investment needed, high learning curve, maybe high technology skills that you'll have to develop. And ultimately, once you've done all that, fairly low odds, but actually working. That's most business models. That's how most of the world works when it comes to business. We've all just kind of resolved that that's how the world works. There's a lot of risk and money needed, and hopefully someday you have a viable business. That's great. A lot of people do navigate that successfully. Most people don't. The replens model, on the other hand, is low, low, high. To my knowledge, it's the only low, low, high business model that can be scaled up to a six-figure a month business that's operating on a hands-free level, starting off with very low funding needed, very low risks. 
very low new technology, very low learning curve, very high odds of success if you follow the program. Does it work 100% of the time? We absolutely cannot sit here and say that because there is an infinitely number of infinite number of creative ways that people can get distracted, derailed, lose interest, lose focus, health issues, family drama issues, whatever. Life can get so life gets in the way. So I can't sit and say absolutely 100% of the time this will always work. But if you do the work, it's as consistent as anything I've ever seen in my 20 plus years. And we hear that from many, many people who have used e commerce and launched businesses. We have people with PhDs, people with uh, their doctors, former you know accountants, lawyers. You hear them interviewed on this show making those kinds of observations. So why is it important for me to lay that foundation before we talk about what we're going to talk about, which is funding your business? Well, because this isn't general advice that applies to all business ideas. If you're sitting over dinner one evening and an inspiration hits you for a business idea and you're going to build the best mousetrap that the world has ever seen and you, you scribble out your business plan and the only thing you need is someone to give you half a million dollars so you can launch your dream, this isn't that. This isn't Shark Tank, right? I have a hard time. I don't know if you're a fan of that show or not, but I watch that show sometimes and oh, it kind of breaks my heart to watch the show Shark Tank. Because it's person after person after person after person who has put in blood, sweat, tears, years, arguments with their spouse, but, you know, friendships that have been broken. Because at one point they had this inspiration. I've always thought the world needed X. So I'm going to put all my eggs into the basket, making sure the world gets X. The next best mousetrap the world has ever seen or whatever the idea is, right? But they've gotten to the point where, man, they're struggling for funding. They're at the point where they, in many cases, if someone doesn't give me a bunch of money, the whole thing kind of crashes and burns. It hasn't really made a lot of money yet. Maybe it's made a little bit of money, but they've been making maybe minimum wage for the past several years, just trying to get this thing off the ground. And at the point now where they're basically begging somebody to take a big chunk of the business from them and help it succeed by pouring money into it. It's just a sad position to be in. That is the ultimate example. Shark Tank is a parade of high, high, low businesses. They're kind of on the tail end of figuring out if they're going to actually survive or not, right? If you think about it, high, high, low, high capital investment needed, high learning curve, high risk, you know, long time before you know if it's going to work out or not. You know, you have to have a high capacity of patience to see if this thing's going to be viable or not. Very low odds of success ultimately. So it's frustrating for me as a guy that teaches a business model where we've got a parade of people spending a few hundred dollars and launching beautiful businesses to watch a show like that because I know it can be done differently. You can eliminate the risks. You can eliminate the long wait before you know if it's viable. You can eliminate so many of the things that go with classical businesses and, and trying to launch a new product. Speaking of which, if you go to YouTube right now and say, I want to learn how to sell on Amazon, 95% of the content you're going to see is people trying to convince you to launch a brand. Well, it does work out sometimes. It works out often enough to keep everybody interested, kind of like buying lottery tickets. You know, that tax on people who can't do math is what I call it, lottery tickets. Your odds are a little better launching a private label product on Amazon, but actually it's about 95% failure rate. That's based on our internal estimation of how many people go to Amazon, try to launch their own product on Amazon and go through all the expensive high, high, low experience of high investment needed, very high level of patience needed, high technology and in, in learning curve needed, low odds of success. It's frustrating for me to see people go through that when I know that we've got a system here that's, again, low, low, high. But even though it's low, low, high, there may come a time where you need some outside investing. And that's where we start to kind of transition away from the people who have no money. So we told them you know, some ideas. And we've got other episodes where we talk about how to get some ideas for generating some money creatively using the internet in your free time. There's dozens of ideas, past podcast episodes. But once you've learned the basics, you know, a few weeks or a few months, depending on how much time and effort and energy you've put into it, there's that a period of intense focused effort. You could stretch it out over six months if you want to, or you can do it in a few weeks. But you've got to learn the basics. You understand what Keepa is. You can look at an ASIN and determine if it's worth testing or not based on the replens strategies that you've learned. And there's some new words in there, but that's the stuff we teach you as a new seller. You learn to become familiar with that terminology. 
few acronyms you pick up along the way. Pretty soon, you sound like one of the nerds in our community talking about their business and you know, selling thousands of dollars a week or even per day in many cases. But until you get through those first few steps of, okay, do I want to do this? Okay, I'm going to spend a few hundred dollars. Okay, I'm going to start to ramp this up with some inventory. Now you're starting to talk about maybe needing some funding from outside sources. What are your thoughts on this? This is where your worldview, your philosophy, how you feel about debt, those things come into play. Am I going to say I'm the ultimate authority? Absolutely not. But I speak from a place of a guy who's studied it in depth over a long period of time, working with respected experts and longtime established principles for what I'm about to share with you. And there's some things you've probably never heard before unless you've listened to all of our past episodes. I may have mentioned some of these things a couple of times in the past since 2016 or whenever it was when we started this podcast. But I don't share them all that often. So I, I want to illustrate the point I'm going to make here with the difference between gambling and investing. And if you've never heard this example before, it's pretty eye-opening, especially if your worldview includes a biblical worldview the way mine does. But even if it doesn't, I think you'll find this interesting. So biblically speaking, I'm not going to dive into all the scripture references right now that go into this, but very easily to make a very strong case that the Bible sees gambling as wrong. It's considered sinful. It's considered dangerous territory. It's right up there with you know adultery and all the other major sins, things that can really take your life off the rails. Okay, gambling is one of them. <laughs> it's like, don't do it. Only fools do that stuff, right? So why is it the Bible calls that risky or even sinful behavior, gambling, but investing is encouraged. The roots of the banking and investing systems that we use in, mo- in the modern world they haven't always existed. You realize that, right? Where'd they come from? Where'd this concept of money and, and holding value and storing it somewhere where you can access it later, or you can even die and leave that value that you created to someone else? Where do those concepts come from? Well, I would argue those are very much biblical concepts from the Hebrew culture. And just as all that came from that culture, the idea of coins and money and exchange, so did investing. And it's actually encouraged biblically. Multiple places, you see the concept of investing encouraged and talked about. And again, without going into the details, there may be someone who disagrees with me on that point, although I, I believe that we could you know, brings a great deal of clarity to that. That's where I enjoy listening to people like Dave Ramsey, um, Daniel Lappin, a couple of folks that I really enjoy listening to on money and their worldviews. I think maybe even Kiyosaki gets some of that rich dad, poor dad, some of the, the biblical history of, can't remember for sure, but just the, the history of money and investing and those sorts of things. I'm not going to get philosophical on you, but I do have a basic question. Just to repeat the question, you may want to pause here and even you know, kick it around. You know, we've got some homeschool families that listen to this program. Ask your kids, parse this out, see if you can come up with a solution. It's not a complicated answer, by the way, but it is, if you've never heard it, it can sound very complex as a question like, I don't know why it's different to invest versus to gamble. What is the difference there? Like, If I buy a stock, isn't that a gamble? I bought it at $40 and I'm hoping it goes up, but it might not. It might go down to 30 or 20 or even zero. I've lost my money. I took a gamble on that investment, didn't I? There's no difference between gambling and investing. It's all the same thing, Jim. What are you talking about? Why does the Bible call one sinful, dangerous activity that corrupts the soul? And the other is something that's encouraged, strongly encouraged in many cases. Why is that? What's the difference between investing and gambling? So this is your chance to pause because I'm going to give the answer. I'm going to count down from three. So you have plenty of time to pause and I'm going to give you the answer. Three, two, one. The answer is relationships. Hey, business building warrior. Sorry for the quick interruption. Just wanted to make sure and remind you about our tremendous sponsor, Payoneer.com. If you need funding, up to $750,000 flexible repayment terms, no credit check. They love Amazon and Walmart sellers. They want to help you grow. Payoneer.com slash funding for 10% off the fees. Be sure to tell them we sent you. All right, let's get back to the show. The answer is relationships. Let me explain that. When we gamble, it's you against me. We make a bet. You know, I bet the next car that drives by is going to be red. And you say, I bet the next car that drives by is going to be black. And the first time we see a red or black car, either you win or I win. And 
Let's say we put $50 on the bet. One of us won, one of us lost. That's a gamble. You gambled. You won, I lost. Or uh, I won, you lost. One of the two. But what does that do to a relationship where people win, lose? They One takes, one gives, and it, that's it. It's kind of like we're adversaries. It's kind of like you know the relationship gets damaged a little bit there. And you can say, oh, it was dull, good fun. And yeah, I have fun with my buddies and all that. Yeah, I, I get it. I understand it. But the, that's the root core of it is without any exchange of value, one of us really lost. And one of us won at the other's expense. And the relationship wasn't enhanced by the experience spiritually. That's what the Bible would say about gambling. Well, what's investing? Well, with investing, we either win together or we lose together. It's done together which is why the sources that you use for your funding, from my vantage point, is it's better off if it's someone you know, like, and trust, who know, likes, and trusts you. So you're close to the funding source. You're doing it together. That's the origins of investing. You've got someone who's lived life well, and they've served others well, and they've accumulated some assets. They've got excess assets. They don't know how to deploy into meaningful ways. They don't just want to let it sitting, which is another biblical rule. If you didn't know in, in the Bible, in the original Hebrew, money and blood use the same word. They operate in much the same way. You know, the blood that circulates in your system. We talk about money circulating in the economy. We have banks for our money. We also have banks for our blood. You ever thought about that before? Isn't that cool? Why is that? If it's not moving, it's dying. True for blood, true for money. How do you keep your money moving? What's that mean? Well, I've accumulated some wealth. I want to put it somewhere where it can continue to grow and serve. I've got more money than I know how to deploy. You'll hear about you know, philanthropists deploying assets, deploying capital into different ventures. They're putting that money out there so it continue to move versus just being buried in a can. There's actually a story in the Bible about a guy who buries the money in a can and he's punished. <laughs> you don't want to just bury it. You want to keep it out there moving, taking risks using it to grow. The Bible talks a lot about stewardship. What is that? Well, that's someone who cares for the property that belongs to another person and expands it over time. And then when the owner asks for the money back or the resources back, you return them with the growth they've experienced. It was never really yours. You were just taking care of it for another. Well, that's how we as Christians see all the things that we have, our money, our resources, our assets, anything we have. None of it's ours. It's impossible for a Christian to be wealthy. None of it is. Right? He's already so wealthy because he has a relationship with the one who owns it all. So, wealth isn't on some kind of swinging gauge based on how much money you happen to have at any given time. It belongs to someone else, but you are responsible for growing and expanding it. All right. So, what am I trying to say here? Seeing at the point where you're ready to put money to work, the Bible very much is in favor of that. So, those of you who operate under the principle that I will never take a loan under any conditions, there's no way ever, ever, never. Lending is always bad. No, you can make a very strong biblical case that lending is smiled upon, but it has to be done with a stewardship mentality, meaning done with the intention of growth. If you're just getting a loan to buy something you need, obviously, very bad idea. A lot of people are stuck right there trying to get over maxing out their credit cards with stuff that they want. If it's something that you are hoping grows your business, however, now we're talking about a different type of loan. And here's some basic advice for you along those lines. Again, having seen many people both fall on their face and thrive using creative funding sources. The best source of funding you can get is from someone who understands your industry, who is successfully lending money to others in a similar business model so you can tap into their knowledge. Because remember, you're doing this together. This isn't a gamble. This is an investment. This is a relationship enhancing investment. You're going to make a relationship with this company. They're working with others in your niche and they know how this niche works. It's not a random credit card. It's someone who understands the business. Now, if you can find some zero interest credit cards and kind of bounce money through those as you're growing your business, that's great. I'm not knocking that. You know, who gives you the best interest rate is a huge factor for sure. But I'm arguing that there's some benefits in working with someone who understands the model that you're building. And we have numerous lenders, numerous sources of funding for our community available at our fingertips. And let me just speak on that for just a moment. It's something you may have heard me discuss before. 
but I can't emphasize enough that if you are completely unbiased and you said to yourself, I want to go find a business model where I have the greatest odds of success that's catching the momentum of the paradigm shifts in our culture, that's forward, has a, has a nice forward looking vantage point of high odds of success, ideally low risks as well. That's what we're talking about here. And one of the things that you can look for, rather than just listening to me or listening to some of our other successful students, one of the things you can look for as you're analyzing business opportunities is you can say, where is the money flowing? Where are their funding sources lined up saying, hey, we want to help fund people in this niche industry because money goes to places where it can grow. If it goes to places where it can die, it slowly vanishes. So who has the money? That's where the good ideas are. That's where the money tends to flow. That's the beauty of free markets. You don't need a really smart person determining where the good industries are. You've got millions of people with slightly developed instincts learning lessons the hard way and being rewarded when they're right. And the money figures out over time where it should go to grow. That's how business operates. That's why industries go under if they become irrelevant and why new industries rise as their relevance rises. You want to be in the ones that have a bright outlook. How can you tell if you're in a business niche that has a bright outlook? Well, where is the money? How freely are lenders lending to those people who have some momentum in that niche? And from my vantage point, you know, I, I, this is a podcast. We have many listeners that listen to this show. Our most excited and aggressive sponsors on this show and people that want to be in front of our community and want to do other things with us and come to our events, man, it's, it's the people who have money to lend to e-commerce sellers. They love lending to Amazon sellers specifically. They love lending to replens sellers because done properly, you can turn $5 bills into $10 bills. And lenders love putting their money somewhere where they know not only are they going to get the principal back, but they're going to get some interest and the borrower is going to be very happy for the arrangement because they've been able to grow their business more quickly. But once you're confident in the risks that you're taking, this is perhaps one of the most important things I can tell you. Just having seen a lot of people take money from outside sources and then try to do things with it, please be confident in your ability to turn $5 into $10 before you take on $500 from an outside source and try to repeat the process. You've got to be confident because sometimes these processes work at a smaller scale. But once you start adding commas and zeros, it gets a little harder to manage. That's why business is a leadership journey. You may have the leadership skills needed to have a team of one or two people turning $5 bills into $10 bills all day, every day. And everyone's happy and you're making money and your, your business is growing. And that's beautiful. But when you start taking outside funding and suddenly you're responsible for more money, and you need a little bit bigger team, your job changes. Your leadership skills that you're required to have changes. You have to grow. That's why growing a business is the ultimate leadership journey. That's why I love quotes like what Jim Rohn says, set out to be a millionaire, not so you can have a million dollars, but so that you can become the kind of person who's capable of having a million dollars. Everyone likes to think they'd make a good millionaire. But the truth is, most people wouldn't because they haven't learned those hard lessons along the way. Of, for example, it'll just surprise you if you've never owned a business before. It will shock you how many holes there are in the bathtub is the illustration I use. You'll think being a millionaire is like having a, you know, a big tub of money. Well, there's a lot of holes in the bottom of that bathtub. And you've got to decide how often are you going to dig down and get down under there with the dust bunnies and examine things and, and plug a few of those holes, which means cutting a person out of your life that You've been friends forever, but they're not contributing any value. They're just kind of getting paid to do nothing. Like, how do you handle that? You never had to handle that before, have you? Plug that hole. Uncomfortable confrontations, difficult discussions, changing from tool A to tool B that saves you some money. How often do you go through and evaluate the tools and, and there's just all the different ways money's leaking out of your life? That's an uncomfortable thing for many people to do. They struggle to do it in their own budget. It gets even more difficult when you've got a bigger pool of money and it's growing and shrinking in new and interesting ways that you've never seen before. It's not easy to manage money and keep it growing. It's very difficult, actually. That's what being a business owner is. 
Some people aren't ready for that. So certainly don't take on more money than you're capable of deploying. I had a friend, this has been many years ago, probably 25 plus years ago. I went to a business conference and he was there. He's actually one of the presenters I'd heard. And, and uh, I don't know what he's doing these, these days. It's been 25 years since I probably mid about that since I've even talked to this guy. But he was very excited because he said, I put $250,000 in the bank yesterday. And I was like, what? You did what? How did you get all that money? That's great. Like, What product are you selling? Who are your customers? He's like, oh, no, no, no. It was business financing. He basically got a loan. He basically got a credit card with a $250,000 limit on it. That's what he'd done. I don't get excited about that. So <laughs> you've got an obligation. You've got a commitment. You got to repay that debt. You got to turn that two hundred fifty into three hundred to have any kind of story to tell. Like, how is that a great story? I got financing. Okay, well, now it's time to actually do the work. Getting the financing isn't profit in the bank. It's just fuel. And if you just burn through the fuel and you haven't gone anywhere, that's a bad place to be. So don't just get money just for the sake of getting a loan because they said I could have it. Absolutely not. Hopefully you've picked up that we're not an advocate for that. But you've got incredible funding sources available to you. We'll stick some information in the show notes for today's episode. Perhaps you've got other creative resources. Again, the closer to home, the more that your funding sources understand the industry that you're in. And then you got to look at the terms. How much is it going to cost me to take this loan? How much of my business do they want in exchange for? helping me grow this thing. There's many creative solutions out there. We are friends of many of those solutions. And hopefully this has helped you begin to think about and have that conversation of when you should start to take outside funds, how much will be necessary, not much, and what it looks like and feels like to do it the right way. I'll tell you one last story that will help illustrate, I think, a nice bow to tie on the top of this box that I've put together for you today. It's been kind of random, but... These are the thoughts that I have on this topic. And I could go much longer on any of them, but I'll I'll cut myself off here. But here's a little story. It's a Dave Ramsey story. I've told it a few times over the years. I like it because it illustrates very strongly several good points. And it's a short story too. Dave Ramsey tells on one occasion that he met a billionaire. And as Dave tells the story, anytime you meet a billionaire, it's always good to have a few good questions lined up. He had decided ahead of time. One of the questions he was going to ask this guy was, hey, recommend a good book to me that I should read and that my entire staff should read. Outside the Bible itself, what else will really help us fine-tune our ability to grow a business and to serve well and to to do it the right way? And the billionaire said, as I recall the story, something along the lines of, well, how many copies do you guys need? And Dave said, well, you have the books here? He's like, yeah, I've, I've, I keep them on hand constantly. I've got them right here. This, this is the exact book I want to recommend to you. And the billionaire pulls this box of books and pops them on the desk and opens it up. And it's The Tortoise and the Hare, the kid's book, The Tortoise and the Hare, which I'm sure you've heard this story before, right? Everyone thinks the rabbit's going to win the race, but the turtle ends up winning. Why? Because a rabbit is bouncing all over the place a thousand miles an hour. Obviously, he's faster. He's making quicker decisions. He's ready to move, ready to pivot, ready to go. Needs a break. Now he's a little burnt out for a few weeks. Okay, now he's back in the action. That guy is going to get destroyed by the tortoise that says, I'm going that direction. I'm going to make slow, steady progress a little bit every day. I'm not going to do anything stupid. I'm not going to get distracted. I'm going to take the time off that I need along the way, at regular intervals. I'm going to live a disciplined schedule. I'm not going to take a million dollar loan that I don't know what to do with, <laughs> or even a $5,000 loan, or even a $1,000 loan that I don't know what to do with. I'm going to take very intentional, slow, steady progress in the right direction. You will get so much further, so much faster with that slow, disciplined approach, which is what we teach here. That's why you hear me say all the time, I'm not really so concerned about where you are right now. That's not all that interesting to me. I'm much more concerned with your trajectory. Tell me where you were six months ago, and then three months ago, and then let's plot a point where you are now. And where are we aiming? We've kind of developed a line. Remember that from geometry in high school? Three points or two points determine the line. That's all you need. Where were you? Where are you now? Let's connect those dots and extend them into the future. That gives us a bit of a trajectory. The more dots you get, you can kind of see this thing taking shape a little bit. Your trajectory matters so much more than where you are right now. Because we are literally the only thing that God created in the entire universe they can wake up one day and say, hey, you know what? I don't like where I'm at. 
I think I'm going to be here a year from now instead. And then we set about doing the things that it takes to make that happen. Nothing else God created can do that. Isn't that cool? He gave us that gift. So use that gift. 